Income inequality is increasing in most big developed economies. But are those at the very top there mainly because they are getting paid more? Or are they increasingly collecting the proceeds of their accumulated wealth? And do we need policy changes to address the phenomenon? Welcome to The Big Question, the monthly video series from Chicago Booth Review. I'm Hal Weitzman, and with me to discuss the issue is an expert panel. Eric Zwick is an assistant professor of finance at Chicago Booth. He studies the interaction between public policy and corporate behavior with a focus on fiscal stimulus, taxation, and housing policy. Gabriel Zuckman is an assistant professor of economics at the University of California at Berkeley. He's the author of The Hidden Wealth of Nations, The Scourge of Tax Havens. And Luigi Zingales is the Robert C. McCormack Distinguished Service Professor of Entrepreneurship and Finance and director of the Stiegler Center at Chicago Booth. He's also the co-host of the podcast, Capital Isn't. Panel, welcome to The Big Question. Eric Zwick, let me start with you. Uh, when we say top incomes, top income inequality, what do we mean by top income? What do you have to earn to be in the, at the very top in the United States? Yeah, so um, I think one of the really useful things for this debate is to be very precise about the object we're trying to study. Um, in the US, I'll give you the number from the top of my head for 2014, which is uh, the top 1% of fiscal income, which is the object that in, in my research I've been focused on, which is data that you observe in t tax returns. Uh, the top 1%, roughly 1 1.5 million tax units, so it's a combination of married and single filers, mm -hmm. who have collective income of over $400,000, roughly, uh, excluding realized capital gains. Then the top 0.1% is going to be uh, 160,000 units. Uh, sort of, okay. uh, they're going to have income over 1.5 million. And then the top 0.01% is going to have income between 10 and 15, depending on how you cut things up. And that's going to be about 16,000 uh, tax units in the so US. So the, the right at the very top, the 0.01% is 16,000? 16,000 16, Individuals or households. Individuals, right, exactly. OK. And, and what, what evidence do we have about, um, about how those groups are becoming more unequal, diverging over time? Yes, yeah, so within those groups, uh, income inequality, or so their share of total income has been going up over the last 30 years, mm -hmm. um, with roughly equal contributions to kind of the share of income within the top 1% going to the 1 to 0.1, the 0.1 to 0.01, and the 0.01. Although, of course, per person, because the 0.01 is such a small group, um, you know, they're getting a lot more income. Uh, so there is a sense in which it's concentrating more at the very top. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. Yeah. okay, Gabriel Zuckman, what, what evidence do you use that shows the same kind of phenomenon, that concentration there at the very top? Tax data are the most important uh, source of information because everybody has to file, or almost everybody has to file a tax return, mm -hmm. and so you can study the, the wealthy using tax data, but uh, for measuring certain things, like uh, the distribution of income, after government intervention, after government transfers and taxes, you need to look at uh, survey data as well. Uh, in recent research with uh, Thomas Piketty and Emmanuel Says, we tried to, to combine all the information that's out there, so tax data, survey data, national accounts data, you know, macroeconomic statistics, to have a kind of comprehensive picture of how GDP, you know, our national income, the total output, you know, and the total income of the country is distributed. And when you do that, what you see is that you know, there's been a, a dramatic change in, in the U.S. in the 1980s. So in 1980, the top 1% earned about 10% of total national income, and today they earn about 20% of total national income. And then when you look at the bottom 50%, so the half of the population, they, uh, they used to earn about 20% of national income, and now they earn about 10%. So it's just the, the mirror image of what has happened in the top 1%. And so the top 1%, which is a group that's 50 times smaller than the bottom 50, they earn uh, twice as much income as the bottom 50. So their average income is 100 times larger than the average income of the bottom 50. And just one more piece of information, which I think captures you know, how uh, terrible things have been for the working class and the middle class in the US. You look at the average income of the bottom 50%, in real terms, so adjusted for inflation, it used to be $16,000 per adult in 1980, and today it's still $16,000 per adult. So the average income for half of the population is $16,000. $16, it's not a lot of income, and it has completely stagnated 
over more than a generation. So you have half of the population that's been shut off from economic growth. Mm -hmm. Let me bring you in, Luigi Zingala. To a certain extent, inequality is inevitable. Um, why, should we, why should we care that this, about this trend? So I will distinguish very much between uh, the first part of uh, Gabriel's uh, conversation, which is about uh, sharing of the pie, and uh, the second part, which is the absolute level. So in China, inequality has gone up tremendously in the last 20 or 30 years, but Chinese are very happy because when, uh, on average, you grow 7% per year and everybody benefits somehow that growth, uh, even the bottom of the distribution is lifted. I think that, to me, what is the dramatic fact that uh, they have established, uh, I think, beyond reasonable proof, but uh, I think is a fact that, uh, in its simplicity, it was around for a long time, I wrote about it uh, in 2012 in my, in my book, is the fact that the median American worker uh, has not seen an increase in, in salary, uh, in real salary, for more than a generation. I think that that is the fact that, uh, in a sense, puts in question the entire system because the capitalist system is based on the principle that, yes, we tolerate an inequality in exchange for uh, a great increase in the size of the pie. A great increase of the size of the pie that must benefit everybody because otherwise it becomes intrinsically incompatible with a democratic country. Let, let's talk about who these people are and what they're actually doing, which is some of your research, Eric mm -hmm. Zwick. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, you find that the people at the top are kind of earning their wealth, their income. Mm -hmm. So tell us about how you found that and who are they? Yeah, so we were very interested in uh, trying to, you know, you have these top level statistics from macroeconomic data from everywhere that sort of have labels that are coarse, labor income, capital income. Um, how we measure those things uh, is not always clear. Uh, we were able to work uh, with uh, co-authors at the Treasury Department um, to kind of go from the bottom up and ask for an individual who's residing and earning income that looks like capital income or labor income at the top of the income distribution, um, what is the nature of the activity in which they're participating? Are they actively working? And I think in that, this research, what we, what we learned from that, the top 1%, um, primarily the median person looks to be a working rich person as opposed to a rentier. Um, this is one of the key facts. Tell us, just, just remind yeah, us what yeah, a rentier, that, or um, rentier. A rentier is right, the, the proper French, French pronunciation. Yeah. So what is a uh, rentier? Which I'll leave to Gabriel. Uh, is, uh, these were the people who at the top of the income distribution in the early part of the 20th century were earning uh, their income primarily through rents, interest, um, and dividends from sort of passively accumulated capital. So they were, they were benefiting Many from- Many of them heirs to wealth or- Yeah, and so there was also a dynastic component to the wealth there that they were um, earning the-, the, the the rents or the coupon, the rents that they are clipping coupons. Uh, these are not like coupons that you take to the store, but the coupon payments uh, from fixed interest, income securities. Yeah. Um, and that was really dominating top incomes at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, Piketty Saez's uh, 2003 paper showed that in the US, uh, the top incomes, while income inequality had grown so much, uh, it didn't look like the rentier society from the early 20th century. It looked like the working rich labor income was very important. In recent years, there's been some debate about, oh, maybe capital income has come back into play. And what we do is we look at what is the nature of this capital income. A lot of it looks like entrepreneurial income, income earned by uh, doctors, lawyers, um, skilled consultants, sort of people in high-skilled service professions that structure themselves as businesses uh, because of tax preference. It looks like capital income, but in the, when you look under the hood, it's kind of a mixed income, entrepreneurial combination of labor income, but they look to be actively involved in um, generating that income. Okay, so uh, Gabriel uh, Zuckman, is, does that sound right, or are you more of the view that this is actual genuine capital income that's driving this inequality? Well, I guess there are two different questions. No, I think it's very important to distinguish two things. So one question is, what's the composition of the income of the, of the rich? Is it mostly labor income or mostly capital income? And another question is, what is the source of the wealth or the capital income of the rich? Is it wealth that's been accumulated out of their own saving? Or is it wealth that's inherited? And when we talk about you know, the rentier, uh, we talk about that second question of uh, inherited wealth being important and people at the top of the wealth distribution uh, having inherited their wealth in contrast to having created their own business. 
So on the first question of whether labor income or capital income is, is more important at the top, I, I, I think, you know, in recent years, when you take a comprehensive view of uh, all national income, uh, it's capital income that's been growing very fast at the top of the income distribution since 2000. Uh, according to our estimates, most of the increase in the top 1% income share comes from an increase in pure capital income, not, not labor income. And in particular, it comes from uh, a rise of uh, corporate profits. So one very striking development uh, in the United States, and in fact all over the world, is the rise of corporate profits and corporate saving. So corporations are very profitable, they make a ton of profits, but they don't distribute a lot of their profits to their shareholders, so they retain a lot of their income. And uh, to study that, you can't you know, uh, only look at, at tax data, individual income tax data, because you don't see this big fraction of corporate profits that are not distributed. But when you take that into account, the, you know, the huge amount of profits of companies like Apple, you know, Alphabet, you know, that don't get distributed to shareholders, when you attribute that income to shareholders, then you see that that contributes a lot to the, 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 the documented rise in income inequality. So on the first question, I think the evidence is more consistent with the view that it's, it's capital income that's driving the rise of overall income inequality in, in recent years. And the second question of whether we are returning to a kind of rentier society, there, there is no evidence you know, for, for the US. So uh, if anything, the evidence is more suggestive of uh, a world where a lot of the wealth right now at the top comes from saving. So people in the 1980s, 1990s, who, 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 who earned very high incomes and then they saved a lot of their income and so that's what explains why they're very wealthy today. You know, people at the top of the wealth distribution, some of them probably are rentier or inheritors, but many of them are kind of life cycle, you know, self-made uh, savers. But they have a ton of wealth, mm -hmm. which generates a lot of, of capital income and so you can, you know, have a society where most wealth is self-made and yet capital income is what really matters at the top of the distribution. And that, I think, characterizes the US today. OK, how does that fit in with your work? Well, so I think, uh, I mean, there's a question. There are two parts to it. Um, and the first thing I'll say is that I think there's like a lot of room for further research um, to shed more light on this. And it's super policy relevant and important. Uh, and I think the final word has not been written yet. Uh, one point is about whether we're talking about people or about dollars. Um, and so Gabriel's statement was primarily a statement about dollars, which was about the share of aggregate dollars that are labor versus capital income. And my statement emphasized more sort of if you look at the median person, how would you characterize the activity in which they're engaging? So there could be a different answer at the person level versus the dollar level basis. The second is that um, there's not um, a completely assumption-free way to take this extra capital income that we don't observe in tax data and allocate it to people because we don't observe their ownership, at least given the data that's currently collected. So we have to make assumptions. And there's a range of assumptions that I think can lead you to conclude one way or the other about the relative importance of capital income, the unallocated corporate profits of Apple and Alphabet, which really depends on how much of the sort of share of Al Alphabet and Al Apple goes to the top 1% versus everyone else. Um, and you know, we have estimates about how much of it is non-taxable, how much of it is in pensions, how much of it is in the nonprofit sector. And so you can have a range of assumptions based on that that can allocate it. And those numbers actually are quite important and change the, the conclusion. So I think more data on the underlying ownership is really important to sort of settle this. But I think we're probably in agreement about this person level statistic, which feels to me like also something that's consistent with the self-made versus dynastic. Uh, point. So I think there's actually more area of agreement than disagreement, um, even if like the punchline sounds different. And, so, and you said it's super policy relevant. Luigi Zingales, what is the policy implication if we say that those at the very top are earning their money as opposed to kind of collecting it? So I don't think that the most interesting question is whether they are collecting out of past savings or whether they are making the money. Because in many of the businesses, the two things are intermingled. So, at the top of uh, his statistics of income distribution, there are doctors, there are dentists, uh, there are car dealers. Uh, so do I make money out of the capital investment in car dealers or I make money out of uh, my skills in the car dealer? 
uh, is very hard to disentangle. I think the more interesting question is whether, as a society, we are rewarding the right people and whether the market is officially competitive or not. And, and I think that what emerges very clearly, especially from Eric's research, because it goes more in this direction, is that uh, these pockets that are making the most money are in sectors that are not very competitive, are sectors that are, are not being exposed to international competition, uh, sectors that generally benefit tremendously from regulation. Uh, car dealers come to mind because they have state regulation that is to protect them. Uh, doctors come to mind, uh, dentists come to mind, uh, and honestly, even if we're in finance, uh, the financial sector comes to mind. So uh, I think that that's, that's a, an important uh, problem we need to consider. And it's very important from a policy point of view because um, the traditional view of income distribution is that you fix it with more taxes or more distribution. Now, what Gabriel's research uh, shows very clearly is that this is a teeny tiny thing that uh, really is not that uh, in the 60s uh, the redistribution were much more massive. Uh, absolutely not. Is that in the 60s the market outcome was a more equal market outcome. And somehow this has been uh, deteriorated. And so I think that questions very much the traditional I would call uh, Larry Summers type of policy where you have sort of taxing and spending and uh, it question a market redesign. We need to bring more competition. We need to actually uh, be more careful about uh, the anti-competitive effect of regulation. We need to attack uh, monopolies uh, in a ma more massive way. And I think this is a new kind of policy that some people here and there are advocating, but it's not the mainstream policy in Washington in any form of the shame, neither for the Democrats nor for the Republicans. And, and is it your contention then that more competition would, would kind of solve or, or address the inequality issue, or does oh, it, I, is it sort of irrelevant? I, no, no, absolutely. It will, it will uh, uh, in, uh, massively improve the situation for, for two reasons. Number one is uh, uh, the people that are earning these rents are earning these rents because there is no free entry, there is no competition. So it will decrease uh, the rent. But also, remember, all these measures of income are deflated by prices. And so part of the reason why the wage, the real wage did not increase is there is a question of numerator and there is a question of denominator. And the denominator is the price level. So in a more competitive sector, uh, many things would be cheaper. So uh, in, in my research, I look at the mobile uh, uh, service sector, and there you see that uh, if the United States at, at the same prices as Germany, we're not talking about an underdeveloped country, and I can assure you when you go to Germany, phones work perfectly fine. So if you at the same price as Germany, uh, consumers of, overall will benefit 50 billion a year, 50 billion a year. So only for this thing, the real wage would be 2.5% higher as a result. Now, you think 25 is little, but his statistics say that in 24 years, the bottom 50% of the distribution got only a 1% increase. So we are almost like tripling the increase just by fixing one sector. Imagine if you are fixing a lot of sectors, what is the outcome? Gary Zogman, what's your view on that? Is competition in itself enough to address the issue? Yeah, and I think tripling just the 1% <laughs> uh, growth rate is, is not enough. You know, that's not, I agree with that. That's not going to fix the problems of the US. So, I, in my view, um, I don't think there's a clear evidence that uh, when you have uh, more competition uh, and a perfectly competitive economy, then you have more equality. I think more competition is probably good for efficiency reasons, but when it comes to the distribution of income and wealth, I think you can have a lot of inequality, even with perfectly competitive uh, markets. And so I don't think that this is going to, you know, to fix the inequality problem. I think if you want to have a more equal distribution of economic resources, you have to uh, look at uh, policies, uh, uh, in particular tax policy, I think, plays a very important role, but also, you know, uh, so policies you, related to the labor market. About the more, what, what, what was characterized as Larry Summers type, the, the more well, Keynesian type tax and spend not, not, not exactly in the sense that I'm not talking about the size of government revenue and government spending, but more about how taxes are collected. That, I think, 
has a big effect on the distribution of pre-tax income. If you have a very progressive tax system with very high top marginal income tax rates, just like the US used to have for half of the 20th century with top marginal rates as high as 90%, then it reduces the inequality of pre-tax income because it reduces the incentives for people to try to capture rents. Because there's no point in trying to earn uh, $100 million or $10 million in income in the financial sector or in other sectors if uh, at the margin, uh, 90 cents out of any extra dollar is going to go to the IRS. And so I think if you want to reduce again, the kind of rent-seeking economy in which we very much live, tax policy and, and, and sharply progressive income taxation uh, uh, plays a very important role. But the trade-off there might be it's less, it's less competitive or less efficient, presumably. There's also, I mean, uh, like a massive weight or, or burden that you place on enforcing the tax code, which I feel like, I mean, the historical record suggests that uh, when you introduced very sharp taxation of income, you also invited a lot of evasion or avoidance or consumption through firms, retained earnings as a way of avoiding those top income tax rates. So there's some sense where the pre-tax income inequality as measured through tax data looks like it's um, you know, been improved, but it's really just because it's been sort of shoved underground or in different pockets offshore, for instance. Um, and so I think there's a lot of burden to enforce. So maybe when you, when you say sharp taxation, you must say also like a much more powerful IRS to enforce the, the rules and also a political class that is somehow immune to the kind of the catering that was always in place after these sharp taxes were introduced. But I would like to dispute uh, Gabler's position that uh, more competition will not reduce inequality. I think that, uh, I'm not saying it's sufficient. I think that, uh, for example, some uh, policies to help uh, create a safety net for people uh, on bottom distribution are necessary and need to be integrated. But I think that uh, I challenge to indicate any extraordinarily wealthy person that did not accumulate that money somehow through some form of monopoly. Uh, I don't know if you know, but Carlos Slim used to be the richest man on earth and drop uh, by 40 billion to position number four. Now, don't feel so bad because he has 50 left. So uh, why did he drop? Because he introduced more competition in his market, which is the mobile market in Mexico. So I think that uh, uh, there is a, a clear redistribution from consumers to producers because the wealth is more concentrated and the ownership of shares is more concentrated, that goes and accumulate in a small fraction of the population. So I think to reduce that, uh, more competition is necessary, probably not sufficient. Okay, and, and you, you've also, in your work and in your, your work on the, on the podcast, you talk a lot about kind of superstar companies and concentration. Um, how does that issue of, you know, the small number of firms that kind of have a lot of market power, how does that relate to the inequality that we talked about at the beginning? So I think this is what uh, Eric was hinting uh, to, is the fact that uh, once we have uh, companies or individuals that are disproportionately wealthy, they tend to have a disproportionate amount of political influence in the system and uh, modify and change regulation and legislation to their own advantages. And uh, the Louise Richard is showing that it's not true that when you have more inequality, you tend to have more redistribution, like we would expect from first economic principles. <laughs> you have actually the opposite. And why? Is because a very unequal top is very able to capture uh, the conversation and change the policy in a particular direction. So I think that uh, is, is very dangerous. Uh, and uh, we witness uh, every day now in the United States and, and the fact that uh, a company like Foxconn got $4 billion from the state of Wisconsin to locate there, I think is an outrage. Uh, is an outrage because the Jewish mark of Wisconsin don't have this benefit. Not only they pay taxes in order to subsidize the big companies. And uh, I think this is an outrage. Okay, what about that point, Gary, about the politics of it? Because, you know, we... We just had some tax legislation passed in the United States which lowered rates and there was not a kind of popular uprising uh, against it, um, lowered rates on corporations and on wealthy individuals, so, or on many individuals. So, um, ha I mean, is there, does America have the stomach for that kind of 
policy? Well, when you look at polls, you see that the tax bill is actually very unpopular. And it's not like it has a lot of support uh, among the American public. And it's true, it's very striking to see that inequality has increased so much and tax policy has become less progressive. You know, the tax system at the same time well, that so reinforcing. That may be connected to this politics that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. it, it, it is, I think, the key reason why, why we care about uh, income and wealth inequality is that wealth, in particular, is power, is political power, and so when wealth is too concentrated, power is too concentrated, and then public policy starts being made uh, mostly uh, at, at the benefit of, of, the, of the very wealthy. So the key question for the country is how do you kind of extract yourself from this uh, plutocratic uh, trap? Okay, Eric Zwick, what's your policy uh, proposal for uh, tackling this issue? Right, so I guess um, I, I'm very sympathetic to Luigi's concern that a lot of the uh, sectors where um, sort of we see top active you know, earners are, are sectors where barriers to entry have been erected. Um, some of these barriers to entry are regulatory, and some of them are really just about opportunity. I feel I see inequality of opportunity to even become a doctor that's across the society that's based on the cost of education, access to sufficient education that I feel like is an important public good that we've underinvested in historically over decades. No, but the number of doctors in the United States is fixed by law. I, I totally so, I, more so than totally bio to agree, enter than this. This is like number one example of bio to entry. At the same time, their distribution does not reflect the population distribution by for many other characteristics, which suggests that there's inequality of opportunity. Well, I'm, as not well as to entry. I'm not disputing. I'm not disputing. No, no, no. I agree that there's a lot of regulatory stuff, especially in healthcare, where the market is not setting the price, and so the private marginal product, which is what we're observing with income data, is not the social marginal product or the social product. And so um, there's a lot of entry in the legal profession where the number of lawyers is not fixed per se. Um, but there's inability for a lot of people to enter that profession because they're unable to afford to get the kind of education required. Um, I'm not saying everyone should go out and be lawyers. I'm saying there are a lot of extremely rich lawyers um, who work really hard and do jobs that I wouldn't want to do as well. Uh, uh, so I feel like investing in education and opportunity is an important piece that I totally agree redistribution is, an, is, is one way to address inequality very directly, um, but you can also uh, address through redistribution of opportunity or distribution of opportunity, making sure we're investing in equal opportunity. Yeah, I think that this is where we should really invest massively and where I think very little progress has been done um, in, on either side of the political aisle. Okay, if this, uh, the current state of inequality is unacceptable uh, or damaging, what is sort of an acceptable level of inequality? Because some inequality in a, in a market system is, is inevitable, so what is sort of how, do, how would we know when we're, make, apart from the trend going down, what, how do we know when we sort of reached a, a good inequality, if that makes sense? Luigi? I think it's very hard to have a formula for this. I think it's a combination of a number of factors, but the first one is clearly we want everybody to benefit somehow of, of the growth. I think that uh, if that's not diffuse, uh, I think that is unsustainable. But the other is also the sense of uh, uh, fairness in which you achieve uh, these results. I think that people are not particularly um, complaining of the inequality in sport. In a sport there is a gigantic inequality. The superstar pay, in my view, an outrageous amount of money, but nobody complains. Why? Because they see their talent and the market is relatively an equal opportunity market, not exactly equal opportunity, but relatively equal opportunity. And so I think the sense of fairness is very important. And I think that uh, what has been broken in America in the last uh, 10 or 15 years is the sense of fairness. And I think that the combination of we don't have growth, uh, there is no sense of fairness. I I'm sorry to say, but six years ago, I said populism is inevitable. And when I said it, people look at me like I was a communist. And uh, unfortunately, I was right. Okay, <laughs> Gabriel Zuckman, what would, it, what would that fairness look like? As, at, at the minimum, you want uh, uh, tax policy to uh, go against the wind, not to increase inequality, but to reduce inequality. So right now, it's, it's striking to see that post the 2017 tax reform, the average tax rate paid by the top 0.1% is going to progressively return back to the level it was in the 1920s. 
when the government was one third the size it is today. So in the 1920s, the top 0.1% paid 20% of its income in taxes. That increased to 50% in the post-World War II decades, and now it's returning to 20%, which is, you know, against any notion of, of fairness and justice that you can have. So what I want to say is, you know, globalization has, has benefited uh, certain groups of the population a lot, you know, big multinational corporations, uh, top earners, and, and these uh, groups of taxpayers should be paying more, not less. What has happened is that the very people who've benefited a lot from globalization have seen their taxes collapse, while at the same time, those who did not benefit from globalization, and sometimes were hurt by globalization, retirees, uh, work, the working class, small businesses, have seen the ta their taxes go up. So a basic fairness uh, a requirement would be to fix that, to, to have tax justice. Those who gain from globalization should pay more, and those who, you know, have suffered from it, who have not gained from it, should pay less. Okay, finally, Eric Zwick, briefly, you, you, you were suggesting that it was more about how you get people into the system and equality of opportunity. What would be a kind of fairness in, in that yeah, sense? Yeah, yeah, so I guess rather than prescribing a specific share that goes to the top 1%, mm -hmm. it strikes me, I mean, we can look almost, this is a revealed preference interpretation um, if the political candidates are talking about populist ideas and redistribution or really, you know, getting a lot of support and there's a lot of anger around inequality, then we have too much probably. Okay. Um, and uh, if instead we were, they're talking about like what we were talking about in the late 1990s, the election was all about protecting social security and the social programs and getting us onto sustainable debt or something like that. Um, where inequality wasn't a big political issue, then we probably are okay. Okay, so we'll watch out for that at the next uh, election. Oh, that's kind of a horrific thought in some way, another election. But uh, in the meantime, our time uh, for this discussion is up. My thanks to our panel, Eric Zwick, Gabriel Zuckman, and Luigi Zingales. For more research, analysis, and commentary, visit us online at review.chicagobooth.edu and join us again next time for another big question. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>